was adopted and converted, converted and adopted. If you never hear her youngest sister, you can tell the difference. <laughs> <laughs> well, she was, uh, yeah, let's she, see. She I guess she was about five when we. Yeah, she had a great influence on her. She, she had to be the southern adopted. <laughs> she was about five when, when we moved here, so. Okay. okay. We're in she's chapter, in South Carolina now. We're in uh, chapter two tonight of Genesis. That's right, we're found in chapter two. Now, God has uh, created man. We'll get into more detail on that, and we'll get into the seventh day. And with the creation of man, something has happened. What do we have with the creation of man? The dispensation of innocence begins. Now, many people don't like to talk about dispensationalism, but the Bible divides itself naturally into God's uh, household economy. And he's going to deal with Adam and Eve in innocence, just giving them a couple of things to do and not to do there. But this is the first of four dispensations that we see in the book of Genesis. We're going to see innocence, human conscience, uh, human government, and promise. Those four dispensations. You won't get uh, the law until Exodus, and then dispensation of grace begins at Pentecost. So chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, we read, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. These, actually these three verses to me more relate to chapter 1 and chapter 2, but you have to remember when these were written, the original autographs, they were not in chapter and verse 4. Man divided those up for us. It makes it easier to find what we're looking for. But this naturally, I think, flows more with chapter 1, but that's not a big deal because it all flows together. So verse 1 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of heaven. The host, the word host, same Hebrew word is used in Nehemiah 9.6, and it depicts stars. Thou even art Lord alone. Thou hast made heavens, and the heaven of heavens, with all the hosts. We're talking about the stars there. In 1 Kings, the word refers to angels. All the hosts of heaven standing on the right hand and on the left. So as we always talk, when you see a word that's used over and over again, we have to use context. We have to look at everything around. Not just the one word. What is he talking about? What we just finished talking about. We know we're talking about creation. So here, we know that he's intending to talk about all the things that God created, all those out there in the universe, all the stars and that sort of thing. Complete. Uh, everything's complete now. Creation is complete. And it says on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had made. The seventh day is the day of rest. It's the Sabbath day. Talking about Andy Griffith now, we were earlier. You'll notice several times in the Andy Griffith show, they will say to their pastor as they leave, Good Sabbath. Is that right or wrong? Wrong. Unless they had Saturday services, it's wrong. The Sabbath is still on Saturday. Sunday is the Lord's Day. Now, it makes a lot of sense when you think about it, especially under dispensationalism, because what is Saturday? The last day of the week, the old. Sunday is the first day of the week. The Lord resurrected on the first day, something new, a new beginning. So that's why it's the Lord's day. The number seven often represents, of course, we know completion and perfection, and also to represent the covenant. So it's no surprise that the Sabbath became the sign of God's covenant at Sinai. Over in Exodus 31, 13, it says, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep. 
For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that doth, doth sanctify you. And in verse 17 of chapter 31 of Exodus, is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. He rested. That is, he didn't get in a hammock, put his feet up, and take a nap. That's not what he's talking about. That means he ceased his work. He desisted. There's no more work to be done on creation. There is absolutely no weariness that's implied here whatsoever. You know, we read in Scripture, Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall never slumber or sleep. It's hard for us to gather some of these things because we're human, we're physical. And as I get older, I even find that sometimes in the afternoon I feel like I need to take a nap. I just got to fall asleep at the desk. God's not like that. He was in no way tired. His creative work was complete. And of course, the Sabbath was a day for Israel to do no work, to rest from their labors of the week. It was a holy day. It was sanctified. It was set aside for the purpose of God. You'll find that at many places in the Old Testament. Exodus 16, 29, for example. See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in this place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. Here, of course, he's referring to the manna. When the law had already, the commandments had already been given, God was giving, giving manna to them to eat. And he says, every day you go out and you get enough manna for each day. Don't take too much. If you take too much, worms don't get it. But on the day before the Sabbath, get two days. He's telling them that you don't work on the Sabbath and I will take care of you. This is your daily bread, if you will. He's going to give you what you need. Exodus 20, 10 says, The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt do no work, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor manservant. Do no work. It is a day for them to worship the Lord. Now, before the question comes up here again, let me say this. The Sabbath was given to a certain group of people, Israel. And the church is not Israel. And Israel is not the church. Therefore, we as believers in Jesus Christ are not required to keep the Sabbath. If you go through the New Testament, you will find nine of the Ten Commandments given again. There is one that is not given. Keep the Sabbath. That's the one of the Ten Commandments that's not reiterated. A lot of people say, well, look what Paul did. He went to the Sabbath day where he went to witness to the Jews. He was not making it a commandment. He's not making it law. We're not under law of grace. That's why it's not, again, given to us in the New Testament. So no, are believers to keep it? No, we're not. We're not Israel, and we're not under the law. The Sabbath, as I said, is the last day of the week, the Lord's Day, Lord's Day Sunday, the first day of the week. That's the day the Lord came forth from the tomb, the first day, the beginning of something new, something wonderful, the dispensation of grace. The Sabbath is the Old Testament of Israel. The Sabbath was given under the law. We are not under the law. I'm going to tell you something else. No Gentile nation was ever under the law. If a Gentile became a proselyte to Judaism, he became under the law. That nation never was. If you read scripture, Moses said unto Israel. I give it to Israel. God said it's for Israel. They were the only nation under the law. Verse 3 says, And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he rest, had rested from all his work which God created and made. Blessed, of course, means to speak well of. We know what it means to be blessed. And sanctified means to set aside. This is a day that is set aside. A day to worship and praise the Lord, he says. And the people need to rest. Sometimes we don't take advantage of the respites we get. There's always something else we want to do. But God says, take that rest. 
that's just the same sense uh, when he says sanctified, that we're sanctified at salvation. The moment we're saved, the Holy Spirit indwells us and we are sanctified. We are set aside for the purpose of God. I like to remind people that you do not have to be dead 200 years and have two miracles to your credit to become a saint. The moment you come to Jesus Christ for salvation, you're a saint. Hagios. Sanctified. You are a saint. It's amazing, isn't it? You are a saint. Does it mean that we're without sin? No, it just means we're set aside for the purpose of God, and He has a purpose for every one of us. If you look back at your life, you can maybe see that. If I look back at my life, there are many times I should be thinking physically, I should be dead. God said, no, I've got something else to do for you, something else you have to do. Same with Jack. God said, no, I'm not through with you yet, Jack, so I want you to do it. He's still here. And I think all of us probably can look back and say, God said, you're set aside for something. And he's going to make sure that you fulfill that. And God set aside this day because it commemorated completion of his creative work. Complete. Number seven, completion. Completeness, perfection. God's Sabbath rest became a predominant theme of Scripture. Here before the fall, it represented perfect creation, sanctified and at rest. I've often wondered what it looked like, how peaceful it was, no sin in the world. Man isn't separated from God. Everything is perfect, and when he created it, it is very good. It was a perfect creation. After the fall, this rest became a goal to be sought after. There's a difference before and after the fall. Before the fall, think about how perfection, how much perfection it was, and the peace. After the fall, you see immediately that peace is gone. We'll be talking about that in the near future. Lord willing, it be not come. All then, that rest wasn't there. Man's been seeking that rest since. You know, this is establishment of theatric rest. Theocracy is what God desired. That theocracy means God rules. It was that rest in the land, and whether by Moses or by Joshua, the conquest, it demands faith and obedience. No matter what, no matter what dispensation, no matter what's the uh, the time for you, it, it demands that. Today, believers enter the Sabbath rest spiritually. Hebrews chapter four, beginning at verse eight, says. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would not would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that entereth into his rest, he also had seats from his own work, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into the, that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrows, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And we will certainly one day share in that full restoration of peace and rest. The account of creation seen through the eyes, the new eyes of Israel in Moses' day, had a great theological significance. Out of the chaos and darkness of a pagan world that they were living at 430 years in Egypt, God brought his people out. What did he do? He taught them the truth. He guaranteed them victory over all the powers of heaven and earth, commissioning them to be his representatives and promising that he would give them that rest. So too, it would be encouraged believers of all ages to know that. That rest. You know, we seek rest, don't we? Evening time, we're ready for that to go to bed and rest. And there's those days we like to just put our feet up on the recliner and rest. We don't know what rest is until we find that rest with the Lord. In verse 4 and 5, we read, These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created 
in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heaven, heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. If you notice in verse 4, in that day, uh, creation week is not specified here as a single day. The phrase rather without the article the means at that time. It could very easily be at that time, referring us back to that period of creation. It means that the whole creative time of God. It most likely would say today, when the Lord made the heavens and the earth, to tell us when this happened at that particular time. Again, there are going to be some people who say, well, look here, the, the Bible is contradicting itself. And that's not true. You need to understand the language that's being used. And even in our country, you need to know where you're from to know what's really being said. Yeah, we, we speak English, but you know, we speak English differently in Virginia than they do in Texas. And they speak it differently in Texas than they do up in Minnesota and you know, different places. And they have different phrases. And it may sound the same, but it has a different idea behind it. That's why we need to know a little bit about the language and what's being said here. The Lord, literally Yahweh, is the most significant name for God in the Old Testament. And it has a twofold meaning. The activity, the self existent one, um, is connected with the meaning of the verb to be. You know, Moses asked, When I go back, the people go, What is your name? What am I supposed to tell them? I am that I am. The ever existent one, the ever present one, right now. I am. Uh, he's Israel's redeemer. In Exodus 6 6. Wherefore, saying to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will rid you out of their bondage. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. The name occurs. I didn't count this. I'm taking that uh, the commentary is correct. But the name occurs 6,823 times in the Old Testament. And is especially associated with God's holiness. For example, in Leviticus 11, For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. So we see it over and over again, and you'll notice how many times in your Bible that it's all capitals. That's how you can distinguish it from the others. And he has a hatred of sin. Genesis 6 will tell us, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he hath also in his flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. And he goes on, he talks about, the, I saw the wickedness of man, and it was great on the earth. And the imagination of the heart, of the thoughts of, the heart, of his heart, were on evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him in his heart. Sin still grieves the Lord today. But he has given us a glorious provision for redemption. Isaiah 51 1. Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord, look unto the rock which ye have hewn, to the hole of the pit which ye are digged. And of course, we could spend probably the rest of the night just looking at those redemptive passages. But we know that God is redemption. And it says every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was no man to till the ground. This sentence uh, actually began back in the last part of verse 4, 4b if you will, at the time God made the earth and the heavens. Then he goes on to say that Nothing was growing in the field as of yet. The kind of plants referred to here are those that require cultivation, which uh, the green plants appeared on the third day. We know that back in uh, chapter 1, 11, and 12. But they didn't grow until after there was a man to take care of them. In creation of man, 
which we'll look at, uh, I like to say shortly, but I know that as slow as I go, it won't be shortly. Uh, the contrast is it's kind of striking against the background of the time when there was no light, no ground, no rain, no one to till the ground. God took great care in forming man. You know, God spoke this into existence and that. And we're going to see that God takes a great deal of time with man. You know, the arrangement of the next six verses include a title, three circumstantial clauses in the Hebrews with when, when no shrub had not appeared, when there was no man to till the ground, when the streams watered the ground. The verb begins the narrative, and he formed. The mirror chapter, it mirrors chapter one with the clauses and things. The repeated emphasis of the Lord God is significant. The, God wants us to realize he's the sovereign God of chapter one, and he's the covenant making Yahweh. He is the one who did it all. He's the creator. And so thus Israel, when they would read this, hear this over their time, knew that the Lord had created everything, and that he had formed mankind by a special design. Over and over, as we go through the Bible studies over these years, how often has the authors of these books reminded us that God created everything? You see, God knew the lies that were going to come over the years about evolution and this theory and that theory. Verse 6 says, But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. This is what makes things so interesting when you get to the story of Noah. It had never rained. Noah didn't live next to a river or a lake or an ocean. And God says, build an ark. It's going to rain. I'm sure Noah's thinking, what's raining? But see, there's no rain on the earth at this time. Mist. That's probably caused by the same thing today. Daily evaporation, condensation, and which occurred at the change of temperature between daytime and nighttime, which was an extreme, but there was a change. And the mist provided enough moisture to allow for proper growth of the vegetation. Again, this is a sign of the power and the plan and the sovereignty of God. Now, God planted everything that was fully grown. And even when man starts to cultivate, those crops are coming up, but he has a responsibility after that to cultivate. Verse 7, And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The work of the Lord in creating human life involved both fashioning man from the dust of the earth and in breathing, breathing into his nostrils the breath of life. In Hebrew and Greek, it's pneumos, the breath. We get the word pneumatic from that. Breath. The word formed describes the work of an artist. When it says that God formed man, the, it's the idea is an artist. You know, I, I can't even draw a straight line without a ruler. But God is the perfect artist. And he creates man in a very special way. It's like a potter shaping an earthen vessel from clay. So that's the way God molded man. Man was made by divine plan. Also, he was made from the earth. He's earthly in spite of the dreams that men had that they could be God, or be like God. And that's one of the lies that Satan is going to use shortly. When you eat of the fruit of this tree, your eyes will be opened and you'll be as God. But they're from the earth. We're not gods. The Hebrew word for man Adam, and that's what's used here. And the word is on in Hebrew is related to the ground. So we are from the you know, ashes to ashes, dust to dust thing. But 1 Corinthians 15 47 tells us something very important. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man, or Adam, is the Lord from heaven. That's what we need to remember. That's what we have to hold on to is Jesus Christ. So man was therefore formed from the small particles of this earth, but his life 
came from the breath of God. What separates man from the animals? There it is. He became a living soul, literally a living person. He was made a spiritual being with the capacity for serving and having fellowship with God. We like to watch old TV shows. I guess all us old folks like the old shows. And one night we were watching a show and one of the little daughters asked a question. Why did God create us? Why did God create man? And they came, no one could come up with an answer. The answer is that we could have fellowship with him. That we could serve and worship him. God loves us. Isn't it wonderful to know that God created you to have fellowship with him? And think of all the people who just disregard that wonderful opportunity to have fellowship with the Lord. So with this special creation in mind, then the reader of this wonderful book, you can really see the significance of the fall. God personally creates you for the dust of the earth and breathes into your nostrils the breath of life. And you're a living being who is able to communicate with God, have fellowship with Him. And since the fall, we've lost that peace, that fellowship. Regeneration, though, for us today, it's amazing. Think about it. It's the inbreathing of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling. The Holy Spirit, again, pneumas. Spirit breathed here in us. And that's what's essential in order for people today to enjoy fellowship with God. The indwelling, inbreathing, if you want to call it that, from the Holy Spirit. The phrase living creatures used of animals and back in chapter 1. Man is distinguished from the animals because he is what? Created in the image of God. That's a major difference there too. Verses 8, 9, and 10 read like this. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life also was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became unto four heads. Mankind was placed in a perfect setting. You know, God created everything on this earth first. And then he created man. And then he put him in even a better place in the garden. The garden actually was an arena to test man's obedience and his disobedience. The, listen to this lavish garden. How God says it, uh, it had trees, had a river in it, wonderful garden, trees, fruit to eat. It led up to a commandment. And man could enjoy everything in that garden except one forbidden tree. <clears throat> it's amazing. Have you ever wondered how many trees were in that garden that man could eat of? I imagine there were hundreds, if not more. And only one tree <coughs> he wasn't eat of. <laughs> Think about that for one tree. And yet that's where the desire comes in this shortly. You know, whereas God possibly created trees with the appearance of age, the trees in the garden were others that had grown later. And out of the ground, the uh, ground made the Lord grow. God grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, good for food, the tree of life in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Among those trees in the garden was one that produced life, the tree of life. And there was another one, you know, that produced knowledge. Mm. Or at least eating from it did. This knowledge of from this tree is experiential. You're going to experience something. Good and evil, just as a figure of speech for us, 
so that we understand the fact that we will begin to understand the difference. Remember, Adam and Eve are sinless. They don't know that there's sin out there. They don't know what sin is going to be like, but they will shortly, they will be able to distinguish good from evil. And that's what's going to happen right after the fall. Man has a conscience. He knows what's right and wrong. So the potential for catastrophe was great. If in self-confident pride they overstepped their bounds and attempted to manipulate life, if they said, oh, I think, I don't know if I trust the Lord, but I think I want that fruit. I want to be smart, whatever. The tree of life, on the other hand, apparently had as a means of preserving, promoting life for Adam and Eve in their blissful state. These trees were in the midst of the garden, maybe in the middle there. They may have been close together. I don't know. But they provided the testing for those two. Verse 8 says, And the Lord planted the garden eastward in Eden. Because of the flood, it's impossible to tell where the garden was. We don't know for sure. I'm of the opinion that it was probably the Holy Land, possibly in Jerusalem itself, because that is such an important place to God. It really doesn't matter. That's just my opinion. That's not biblical. Eden means delight. The trees, the river, the precious gold, the gems, the garden is going to be done. will also be in the new earth, and the eternal state, all those things we see in the garden. The new creation will be endowed with all these elements. That indicates that paradise is going to be restored in the new earth. Revelation 20, 11, and 12 says, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Then he talks about the twelve pearly gates, and then he talks about the river of life and the pure river, just like you see in Eden. And I am going to stop there because I promised I would keep it a little short tonight. Maybe we can get out before the next wave of storm comes in. Anyway.